Hey everyone, it's Ben from board to bits and this is part 18 of our Unity series on creating a point-and-click adventure game. In our last video, we set up our prototype switcher, which works and it's functional, but it's not really optimal yet. Right now, how we have our switcher set up is that we have the switcher um, on our clickable collider object, but then it requires, in order to react to anything, it requires um, that the reactor be on that same object, and then the reactor is actually finding this separate mesh renderer um, via searching through the hierarchy, and it's really, like I say, not an optimal solution. There's a lot of opportunities for mistakes to happen, and there's a much more, um, frankly, efficient way that we can do this. Currently, um, it's kind of set up where when we click on this can prop, it then has to look at, oh, what things care about this, and let each of them individually know, oh, you should be changing, and so then the color reactor um, does that. What would be much more efficient is if this can prop could just say, oh, I've been changed, and anything that cares about that can then change along with it, and just know inherently to do that. And the way we're gonna do that is through a system called events and delegates. Um, Another just quick way of looking at the structure is thinking about a light switch and a light bulb, which I know has been a very popular uh, metaphor for me in the past few videos. Um, the light switch doesn't really care what's plugged into it. It'll provide power or not provide power based on what it's set at, but it really doesn't care. You could have a light bulb plugged into it, you could have a TV plugged into it, you could have a power strip with seven different items plugged into it. It's just a light switch. What cares is those items. The light bulb cares what state the light switch is in. The TV cares what state that um, switch is in. Anything that needs the power is what's going to be paying attention to the state of the light switch. And that's really what events and delegates let you do, is you create an event on that light switch or that, you know, that switchable node, and then everything that can be affected by it then says, oh, I want to pay attention to you. And so the best way to um, explain how do we create these events and delegates is probably to dive into it. I've been, um, I've been programming in Unity for a couple years now, and I'm still kind of wrapping my head around events and delegates. They're a very powerful tool, very helpful, um, but it takes a little, really takes kind of working with them to know what, um, what you're doing with them or how they're working. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our switcher um, script and we're going to create our event setup and the first part of this is going to be a public sorry it's public yeah sorry public delegate so the first thing we're going to do is create our event setup And how we're gonna do that is we're gonna create a public delegate. We're gonna call that void on state change. We're gonna give that parentheses. So what a delegate is, is basically it is a variable, much like a bool or an int or anything like that, but instead of putting in a, a um, piece of information, you're putting a function into it. And delegates, I think what's what's confusing for a lot of people about delegates is that a delegate isn't like just saying bool or int. What it's really doing is you're kind of defining what that bool or int is gonna be, or in this case, what your function is going to be. Imagine you're creating C Sharp for the first time and you're saying, this is a bool. A bool can only be one of two things, true or false. Or you're saying, this is an int. An int always has to be um, you know, a um, round number. It can't have any decimal places. Um, a byte has to be between 0 and 255. You're setting up those rules. And similarly, when you create a delegate, you are saying these are the rules for this delegate. Functions that are going to um, use this delegate need to follow these rules. And in this case, what we're saying is we're saying two things. We're saying void and we're saying no parameters. So that means this any function that you know falls under this is not going to return anything and it requires no parameters. This is obviously the simplest version of this, but you could have you know, something that returns an int, something that requires a couple parameters, so on and so forth. Now, this is the first part of this um, event system. The second part we need is the event itself. 
how we create that is we're going to say public event on state change because this event is now the type of this delegate and you'll see in a moment this is actually going to turn blue much like our uh, void or our bool would do um, and we're just going to call that change now it's worth noting you are not putting parentheses on this because it's not a function call it's actually a name of our event um, so it's more like the name of bool than it is like a function call like on state changes here so now that we have both of these what we can do is instead of how we have our setup here right now is we're saying we have a component called state reactor on us if so long as it's there we can tell it to react instead we're not going to tell anything to do anything we're just going to say oh i've been changed this event happened i've been changed and if you're listening you should probably do something too so how we do that is we're going to say instead of um, all this about the state reactor we're just going to say if change does not does yeah not equal null then we call change and this is where we're actually calling change at this point this is what this is saying is any function that is in a, in change should fire now and um, it's worth noting that um, events like these are almost like lists and that you can add and subtract um, functions to them as you're doing your program you might have something if an enemy dies it might no longer need to be listening for something so you can remove it um, it is important though that if ever change is completely empty there's nothing listening to it you do not want to actually call change because then it will throw an error so that's why we do this um, if statement bracketing our actual change call so that's really everything that this switcher needs now all it's doing is now instead of telling the, the state reactor to change it's simply saying I changed do with that what you what you will so now we can go into our state reactor um, oh one thing I did one thing I changed on here ahead of time and sorry I got ahead of myself is I had a require component call up here um, I believe it was require component um, switcher if I remember I think it was that you'll I don't know why I'm retyping it for you but you're probably seeing this above yours delete that we're not going to need that anymore and this is really helpful to us because it means that a it's not tied to the switcher um, to the switcher on the same object and B uh, we can that means that we can put this um, reactor or any reactor anywhere in the world we want you could have you know you could have a switcher in one room affect something on the complete opposite side of a building you're working on it um, it doesn't matter so long as you you um, wire it correctly as we're going to do in a second here so we're getting rid of that oh, yeah we'll convert line endings um, next thing we're going to change is we're going to change this switcher from protected to public and the reason for that is we want it to appear in our inspector because we want to be able to tell like I said this is not no longer attached to the same object so we are going to need to tell um, any given node what switcher it should be listening for and then lastly in here we no longer need to get the component switcher but what we do need to do is tell the switcher switcher dot change plus equals react which basically is adding our react function here to this event so that then if this event happens so will this reaction function and it's worth noting again no parentheses here or here because this is a um, these are the, we're actually calling the names of these functions and not calling the functions themselves so we're just saying referring to the function not actually having it do its job which is not how you usually work with functions but in this case it's really powerful and helpful to us so now that we have this set up this way what we can actually do is we can we no longer need this um, color reactor that is on our cam prop because the can prop doesn't have a color if we look here there's no actually we do have a mesh renderer on that and we don't need one the more I'm looking at this we can actually delete this we can remove this component because there's no there is no um, there's no shape here that we're rendering so we can get rid of that um, However, our CAN model does have this mesh render, and that's what's showing this green color or the color that we want to show when we click on the CAN. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove this color reactor component as well. We're going to put that 
onto our can. And now all we have to do is we want to set our colors again. So we'll set this to the yellow for when it's active. Make sure your alpha is all the way up as well. And we'll just keep it green when it's inactive. But now all we have to do is tell it which switcher it should be listening to. And so in this case, it's going to be our can prop here. That's how that's got the switcher component. So we'll go down and then drag can prop right onto there. Click save. And so now when we hit play, what will happen here is we move over here, go here, and it changes color. Now there is one change we're going to need in here. Um, because what we're doing, what we did originally was we had told color reactor to the mesh should be the component and its children. We don't want that anymore. We want it to just be get component because we're actually putting this onto the object with the mesh renderer. And it's actually worthwhile for us here to say require component type of mesh renderer. And the reason for that is here it makes a lot more sense. We're changing the color of something, which means it has a mesh. So we want to make sure there's a mesh that we're changing the color of. Whereas before, we were just saying in any reactor, we need to have a switcher, and we don't need that. We actually don't want there always to be a switcher. We want to be able to affect things that are things that we can't normally reach or touch or interact with. That's you know kind of the, the cool idea of like a point and click game like this is that you're, you know, you're hitting a button here, and then somewhere else something happens. So we want to make sure that um, we're not requiring that to be tied together. But it does make sense that if you're changing the color of something, it should probably have a mesh that's being rendered. So now that we have that, the last thing I'm going to do here, I'm going to just add one quick line here. I'm going to add React at the very start of the game too. And the reason for that is because right now our inactive color is green and our actual object's color is green. But say we made this like purple. The problem is right now if we were to start our game, or as we had the script before, if we were to start our game, this would be green. And then when we clicked it, it would be yellow, and then it would go back, and now it would suddenly become pink. And that's kind of confusing. Like, why is it changing colors? Why isn't it going back to green? What that quick line I added there, the React line, just makes sure that when we start the game, this color is matching one of the colors that we're using for the actual reactor. So now we can try this again. See, it changed color to that purple. We can go over here, though. And as we click, we change it to active, to inactive, active, to inactive. And if we look and say, I make it yellow, which should be the active color, if I go to the can prop, we see that the state is in its active state. So that's exactly what we want. It's really, like I say, it's the same functionality as we had before. But here's, I'm going to do one quick last thing, and that's going to show you the real power of this. I'm going to duplicate this can model. We'll name it, um, let's name it blue can. And I'm going to take this out of here, actually. I'm going to put it. So it's no longer childed to this. Um, we could even put it, if we wanted to, say, um, yeah, let's move it over to that other box that we have, the table we have. Um, go way down over here. Yeah, we'll put it right there, right in the middle. And now for this one, I'm calling it blue can, so I'll make it the color blue. And we'll make it turn like a bright orange, um, nice bright orange when it um, is activated. Now I'm going to keep our scene view actually on these because we're not going to be able to see it directly. But the important thing to note here is that our switcher, in this case, is still that can prop. So even though it's way on the other side of the room, it's not childed to the same thing. I can even make this a child of that table now. Um, it's still being affected by this can prop, which means that um, even though it's over there and not related, it's still listening, and when we change it, it's going to change color. So we'll hit save, hit play, change to blue because that was the color that we set it for for inactive. And now if we move over here, I'll zoom in on this a little bit more, go to our can, and now we click on our can, and you see that this one is changing color as well. And that's because it's listening for that change. 
And that's, like I say again, really what makes this so useful and um, it's going to give us a lot more flexibility. We can add as many, we can have as many objects as we want listening to this switcher. Um, it's just, it gives us a lot more versatility. And then, like I said again, it's not requiring us to tie every single, it's not requiring us to tie our switcher to every single possible object it could change. Instead, we're just saying when we create an object that should be affected, tie it back that way, which is a lot more logical and um, saves us a lot of work too. So thanks for watching this episode. Um, next, we're actually going to get into prerequisites. We're probably going to be using some more of these um, events and systems for listening and checking to um, make sure that our prerequisites are met before we start affecting certain switches. This is going to uh, really start us into building puzzles and making our world more robust. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.